In woodworking, the most accurate line you can use to mark your work is a knife line. Marking knives or striking knives have been common tools in the wood shop for centuries. Not only does a striking knife make a more distinct line than a pencil, but it also provides an index that you can index other tools into, particularly if you are chiseling or sawing. By putting your saw right in the knife line, you get a very clean cut. And there's no splintering on the good side of the cut. There might be a little on the far side, but this is scrap. Today there are a wide variety of knives used by woodworkers. This very delicate spear point knife is quite popular. But many people are still fond of the classic hand forged marking or striking knife. It is a classic tool for the wood shop. So today I thought we would take a look at making a woodworker's marking knife or striking knife. To make a striking knife or a marking knife, there are lots of material choices out there. This isn't a project that is really all that picky on what you make it out of. The key element is that it has to be hardenable and it has to be able to hold a good sharp edge in use. So that tends to be a fairly simple carbon steel, something like 1075, 1085, 1095. Good place for something like W1, even O1 but you don't need to get into real exotic steels for something like this. My preference is generally for a steel that will hold a good edge, but will also be easy to sharpen. So generally I don't like the air hardening steels. While they hold a good edge, they are more difficult to sharpen. I frequently make these out of W1 because I can buy all of that that I want. It's all known steel, it all behaves the same, it's predictable, and I can produce regular results for customers. However, if you've got some salvage steels around, a lot of those are going to be just fine. Things like automotive coil spring or heavier garage door springs will probably make a very good striking knife. A lot of that stuff is 5160 or better as far as the carbon content goes. Today I thought I would use lift rake tines. These are the big semicircular hay rake tines that used to be quite common. They aren't so common anymore. In fact, I'm not sure if anybody still uses this style of a rake tine. So they're getting a little harder to find, but most of these are about 1095, something real close to that. Beware though, some of them are A2, so you need to test them and make sure you've got, and make sure you know what you have before you start working with it. But this stuff behaves like 1095. So let's go ahead and get this hot, and we'll cut a little piece off to make our striking knife. I'm going to start by cutting off about four inches of this bar. So that's about 100 millimeters. And the bar is about 13 millimeters in diameter, or about a half an inch. None of that is critical. Don't get hung up on the exact measurements. These are one-of-a-kind tools made this way, so you don't have to make yours match mine. Now here's one that has been rough forged. It hasn't been ground or finished, hardened, tempered, any of that. But just kind of shows you the shape we're going for. This one overall right now is about 10 inches. It will be a little shorter once it's all finished. The, the all side is six and a half inches long, and this is about three and a half inches long here. Again, none of this is that critical. I'm going to take about half of this and draw it out into the all side, or the pointy side. I want to set that up right at the edge of the anvil so that my hammer and anvil edge line up flush. Once I establish where my shoulder will be, I'll move to the horn.
Now, personally, I'm more concerned with getting a nice graceful taper than I am with a specific length. I don't think that really matters that much for these knives, so make it look the way you want it to. So the end of this is just fine as far as I'm concerned. I just need to work on this transition point up here. This cools off fast, so there's a lot of back and forth to the fire. But that's getting very close to what I want. And I don't need to finish this at this point. I just want to get it established. I'm going to knock the corners down. I like these octagon, just personal preference. But I'm not going to worry about finishing that entire scribe end until I've done the blade end. So this heat will turn it around and we'll work on this end. You'll probably need another pair of tongs for this. Rarely does the same pair of tongs do the whole thing. Now I want to spread this widthways and in length. And that's again my preference. Nothing magical. I just like that flared kind of fishtail shape. Kind of like that. We want to clean up the, the edge and make it nice and flat and straight. The more of the shaping you do at the anvil, the less work you'll have to do with a file or a grinder. That's getting pretty close. Just get it good and cleaned up. And even though you want to avoid doing way too much work with a file or grinder, you're going to need to do some. At the very least, sharpening it will involve stones. Now to save some filing and grinding, we can actually trim this right here at the anvil. And we do it all from one side. Careful, don't go all the way through into your hurdy. And what that does is that creates our bevel, as well as the slope or the angle that I like on these knives. And this angle I don't think is real critical. The bevel when I grind them, I usually go to about 30 degrees, but I don't think this slope matters so much. It's just to get a good sharp point down here. Now let's look at the one we just did here. The flat side of the blade is on the right-hand side of the knife. The bevel is on the left-hand side of the knife. In use, these are generally run down a square, straight up and down, with the good side under the square, and the waist is on the bevel side of the, where the knife is. So as you cut like that, this knife works best on the left side. And on the right side, you would want one that's the exact opposite. Now typically, people just use one. If you're right-handed, you use a right-handed knife. If you're left-handed, you use a left-handed knife. And you learn to adapt and deal with what that means. But think about that when you cut this. Are you making a right-handed knife or a left-handed knife? Now I put my touch mark 
on the bevel side. I don't want anything at all on the back side of this because it needs to be polished up as part of the sharpening process. So I don't want anything that might interfere with that. Because putting the touch mark in frequently kind of bows this, I want to clean that up just gently without damaging the touch mark. So now hopefully the blade side is completely done. But in doing so, we've kind of bent and twisted up the all side. So now we're going to finish it and refine that. Mostly it's just straightening it up. We've done most of the tapering already. That could be a little bit better. And then as I mentioned before, I like to go octagon on these. That's just personal preference. So that's pretty good. Clear up into here somewhere. Now we'll just round up the rest of that. Just make sure it's straight. You can do a little straightening cold after it's been normalized and before it's been hardened and tempered. That's pretty much all of the forging steps for our marking knife. It's got a blade section and an awl section. Nice little transition that will clean up a little bit with a file. Got my touch mark. The bevel is established, but not super thin. And you don't want to go too thin because you can decarburize some of this and then have trouble with it holding an edge. I'm going to heat that up one more time to a dull red, and then I'm going to set it aside and let it normalize. Then we'll do a little grinding. Now, after the epic amount of filing we did in the wing divider video, I thought that maybe I wouldn't get quite so carried away on this project. So I'm just going to cover the basics. The amount of filing, grinding, or finishing that you want to do is entirely up to you. In the end, the only thing that really matters is that the back is good and flat so that it can be polished as part of the sharpening, and that the bevel is good and flat so that it can be polished as part of the sharpening. The, of course, the same thing would then apply to the, the all point. It's pretty easy to polish up. The rest of this can be rough if you want it rough. It can be simply filed and no real finishing. It can be mirror polished. It can be whatever you want it to be. We're just going to file this to shape real quick, flatten the back, then we're going to harden it and temper it. I'm going to start with a half round file and file the shoulder right up here between the blade and the awl section. I want to make this pretty straight across the, the top of the blade edge. But it isn't absolutely critical. Just a little bit of cleanup on the all blade just to make everything transition nicely. This would be a good thing to work on in a filing vise, probably. I think I'll switch to that in a minute and try that out. Now this plane across here and the, the bevel angle need to end in a pretty crisp corner here. You don't want that beveled off or rounded. But some of this can be done after it's hardened and tempered. It's just a whole lot harder. And a whole lot more difficult. Now 
Now the side with the touch mark really doesn't need any work if you don't want to. But this back side definitely does. As flat and perfect as you can make it, especially close to the edge. Ultimately this will be done on sharpening stones. But the more you can file, the better off you are. Try to avoid rolling the file this way, you don't want to round that up. So I've got most of the hammer marks out right here, and that's going to need some fine finishing, so that's probably okay for now. It certainly doesn't hurt if you get that whole thing perfect though. Now I put an octagon shape on this, and if you want to file that in to make it look better and crisper, the filing vise is great. And of course if you have a belt grinder that will make your life so much easier. You can do some of this with an angle grinder, but it's kind of tough. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I am treating this as though it is 1095 steel. That seems to be the closest match both between spark testing and hardness testing. And that is one of the steels that the hay rake tines are often made out of. So that's how we're going to harden and temper it. I like to use a cell phone app called the Heat Treaters Guide Companion to look a lot of this stuff up. It's got lots and lots of information. But according to that app and anything else that I've looked at, 1095 should be oil hardened. Now the first thing I'm going to need to do is heat my oil. It's about 40 degrees in the shop. It was down in the 20s overnight. So my oil is probably in the mid 30s. Your quench oil should be warm. In fact, too warm to even put your hand in. Somewhere in the 150, 200 degree range is probably ideal. And this small stuff will shock so easily and cause problems if you don't take the time to preheat your oil. Plus you get a more even quench in the, in the heated oil. So take the time to preheat the oil. But then I'm going to use a torch to heat this up because I don't need the whole thing hot. I just need to get about an inch, inch and a half of the blade, inch, inch and a half of the awl. And by using a torch, I can do one end and then I can do the other end. Whereas if I put it in the forge, the heat's just going to be way too intense and I'll have to try and get the whole thing hot, quench the whole thing, and then do some fancy tempering to get what I want. So I hope that doesn't confuse you too much, but I'm going, to preheat the, <clears throat> I'm going to preheat the oil and then I'll meet you right back here as soon as I'm ready to go to the torch. Now I've heated up a big bar in the forge and preheated the oil with it. And now we're going to go ahead and just heat the very end of this up, maybe an inch, inch and a half, something like that, and quench it. And I'm going to use a real soft flame on the torch and try and heat it real evenly. I'm starting back here so I don't have a real sharp transition between what is up to hardening temperature and what is not. You can certainly do this in the forge, just go real slow. If it's a coal forge, keep the blower turned way down, or for that matter, bring the fire up to heat and turn the blower off. And let this just sit in the hot coal. And the same thing for a gas forge, really. You can heat it up, but it's real easy to get stuff too hot. I think as blacksmiths, hardening and tempering in the fire, we often overheat stuff that increases grain growth and increases the risk of fracture. And there's just no reason to take the chance if you don't have to. That's all you've got. Just learn to do it that way and try not to get it too hot. The ideal temperature for this steel is 1475, which is really a dull red. So that's really about as hot as it needs to be. I just want to make sure it penetrates all the way through, kind of give it a little bit of a soak here. 
I just want to hold it at that temperature as much as I can. And then I want to quench on a rising heat if possible, which means it's, I don't let it sit here and cool down to the right temperature. That's a, a heat going the other direction. I want to take, as soon as I take the torch away, I want to get it in the quench. So we are ready to quench. Move it up and down. And after it's starting to cool some, you can move it in a figure eight motion to keep any air bubbles down. If you do that too soon, you could warp it. Not a huge problem with some things, but the more delicate the tool, the more likely it is to warp that way. So that should be good and hard. Let's test it with a file. The file doesn't even think about cutting that, so it's very hard. But you can feel it back here, it does cut. So we have a nice differential hardness. Good and hard from about here up. That's probably about 200 years worth of use for this knife. So now we need to do the same thing to the other end. Again, there's just no reason to harden this whole thing if you don't need to. Although if you're using a, an electronic heat treat oven, sometimes it's easier to just harden the whole thing and then differentially temper it after the fact. Again, up and down and then around in a figure eight. Keep moving it up and down though. It is possible to create a sharp transition between hard and soft, and that's a place where it'll want to crack. People used to refer to that as a water line or a water crack. I guess in this case it'd be an oil line. No test that. Again, good and hard. You can compare down here where you didn't harden it, and that's not hard files easily, but the tip does not. So now you're down to grinders and sharpening stones if you want to do anything with that. But we need to get this in to temper quite quickly. This is as stressed as it can get, and it really wants to crack at this point. All, all those steel molecules are just tight and trying to blow each other apart. So temper it as quickly as possible. If you let this sit for a few hours or overnight, there's a good chance it will crack when it really didn't need to. And my preference is just to put it in a toaster oven or the kitchen oven, as long as you wash all the oil off and don't stick up your kitchen. And I've got this one set at 450, set the timer for an hour, and that should do it. Now certainly if you don't have a toaster oven in the shop and you don't want to take a chance on stinking up the house by you doing this in your kitchen oven, you can do this the old way by watching tempering colors run. And we've looked at that in previous videos. I'll try to link to one of those right up here so that you can take a look at that process. I don't like to do that, especially for tools that I'm selling, because it is never 100% accurate. The colors never run perfectly even. So you get one corner of the tool that's been tempered back a little bit further and is therefore softer. And another corner of the tool is harder, might be a little bit more brittle, more likely to crack. Makes it hard to sharpen straight and even. It just isn't an ideal situation as far as I'm concerned. Plus when you do that, you end up with a hotter area back towards the back of the tool so it tempers further, which is kind of nice because it won't be as brittle and it makes for a tougher tool. But the only part that is tempered exactly the way you want it is right at the edge. Every time you sharpen it, you're getting back into softer and softer steel. And it doesn't take real long before that becomes an undesirable situation. So my preference is to harden as much as I think needs to be hardened for a good long service life. Like I said, I think this tool can be used for several hundred years before you get beyond the part that we hardened. And then temper the whole thing so it's tempered evenly. That should make for a good consistent edge throughout the tool's entire life without it getting progressively softer as it gets sharpened. 
I've made several of these knives today, so I have a few more that I need to go grind and get ready to harden. Then we'll head back into the wood shop and try out the knife that we made for the video today. Our knife is now complete. It's been hardened, tempered, and it is just nearly sharp. I took this down to a 600 grit finish on the back of the blade at the belt sander and just started to raise a burr on the cutting edge. The last thing I want to do is take it to some sharpening stones. And for this, I typically use diamond stones up to a 1200 grit diamond stone. But any stones will work if you like. If you prefer Japanese water stones or oil stones, those are just fine as well. I have a set of three diamond stones mounted to a board here. I've got a coarse stone, which is 250 grit, medium stones, 400, and a super fine that is 1200. And because I've already taken this down to 600, I'm not going to do much, any work at all on the, the 250 stone. I'll start with the 400 stone just to make sure the edge is good and sharp. And I just use glass cleaner as a lubricant for this. And I hand hold it. You can use a guide or a jig if you want to. Because I've already taken the back to 600 grit, I'm not going to do anything to the back. And that's all I need to do to just raise a little bit of a burr because I got it so close up in the shop. A little bit of the glass cleaner on the super fine stone. And all you really need to do here is just take the scratches from the coarser stone off and then take the burr off. I'll go back and forth a couple of times here just to make sure that the burr is gone. This is really all there is to it. If you like the, the looks of this sharpening system, this comes from Paul Sellers. And Paul Sellers has quite a few YouTube videos and some subscription videos and things like that out there. And is a very prolific hand tool woodworker and a great teacher. Now uh, there's still a little burr. I can actually see that. I don't think you can on the camera. But just a thin wire edge that just bends back and forth. To get that off, we'll strop it. And I just use a leather strop mounted to a board. It's just charged with buffing compound. This you have to make sure you just pull or it'll dig into the strop. This is the way I sharpen my plane blades and my chisels and everything else. Quick and simple. Now, I didn't actually sharpen the all point, but you could work the all point on here. Just rotate it as you work it and you can get that sharp. I'll need to go back to the shop tomorrow and sharpen it. I just forgot about it. But typically I do sharpen that and that way you can use it for as a scratch all in places where you don't need the knife. There's no sign of that burr left anymore. Now at the beginning of the video we looked at comparing a pencil line to the knife line. Pencil lines have width and if your pencil gets dull the line gets wider and gets fuzzier and you have to decide which side of the line you're cutting on all sorts of stuff, but the knife line leaves a sharp groove that's easy to find and you can work it a little deeper and a little deeper and this vertical edge is always going to be accurate. The, the outside edge not so much and I like to use the knife just to take a little bit of a shaving off here to relieve that edge and leave it standing and if you need to go back you can go back But that's very accurate. Now if you're on this other side of the board, well you either turn the board around and you still use the right-handed knife, or you can have a left-handed knife. This one hasn't been sharpened yet. It would work on this side of the square. But most people don't tend to do that. Most people just pick a right-handed knife if they're right-handed, a left-handed knife if they're left-handed. If you want the option of both in one knife, you can make a spear point knife. And it works on, on this side or it'll work on this side. Just depends on what it is you need and what you like to work with. You 
And here is an assortment of knives that I made today in the shop, all part of doing the video. This left-handed knife is the, actually the one that we forged as part of the video, but it has not been hardened and tempered. This is the one we hardened and tempered. Now this video is certainly not meant to be an instructional video on how to use a woodworker's marking knife, just to introduce you to what the marking knife is. If you're a woodworker, you probably already know, and you may already have one, but if you don't have a hand-forged one, you ought to get out to the shop and you ought to make one for yourself. And as I mentioned, the sharpening stone setup I use is one that is based on the teachings of Paul Sellers, and I will link to one of his videos or his YouTube channel or something up here in the corner so that you can find his stuff. If I can find one that actually shows the sharpening stones, I'll make sure that I link that video, but I may have to hunt for it a little bit. I do hope you enjoyed this video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends, but then by all means, get out to your shop, make something, perhaps a marking knife if you're a woodworker, but do so safely, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one. If you would like to support the videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links down in the video description to both PayPal and Patreon. These are merely donations. The content is free and will remain free.